The singer Andy Williams famously sung the song, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. But is it? Is it really? Or is this season not so great for you? I mean, I know that it is supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year. That's what people say. That's what the song declares. But for many of us, this has become the most stressful time of the year. It's the most stressful time of the year. You've got to go shopping from mall to mall, hopping, can't find what you need. It's the most stressful time of the year. It's the stress, stressfulest season of all. The store's overheated by crowds, you're defeated, the lines are too long. It's the most stressful season of all. You circled the mall for at least half an hour in search of a parking place. One's going to be open, you pull up, they're hoping, and some jerk pulls into that space. It's the most nerve-wracking time of the year. The children are tired, they're cranky and wired, they're starting to scream. It's the most nerve-wracking time of the year. wants a toy that is sold out already you can't find it though you try your credit cards maxed out so is your checkbook you 15 more presents to buy it's the most stressful time of the year your neighbors Play lights are keeping you up nights as music's too loud. It's the stress, stressful it's time. It's the most nerve-wracking time. It's the most stressful time of the year. Wow, I bet you did not expect that when you came this morning. Hoo-hoo. You know, in our series, A Purpose-Filled Christmas, we have been attempting to answer one very important question. We've been seeking to answer, what is the purpose of of Christmas. I mean, it, it can't be that. We've been asking the question, what is the purpose of Christmas and how can we fill our Christmas season with purpose rather than chaos that our culture seems to tell us is the meaning of the season? In our first two weeks of our series, we looked at the birth of Jesus and we looked at how his birth can bring deep and meaningful purpose to this what has become very chaotic season. The first purpose of Christmas that we uncovered a couple of weekends ago is that Christmas is a time to celebrate. We said that Christmas is a time to celebrate, not just a time to hold parties, not just a time to get together with friends and family, but to celebrate the birth of a Savior. We celebrate that God loves you, We celebrate that God is with you, and we celebrate that God is for you. That was what our first purpose of Christmas was in this series. The second purpose that we talked about is that Christmas is a time for salvation. We celebrate that God saved us, that he he saved us from something, for something, and by something Jesus' birth saved us from our sin and separation from God. It saved us for his purposes in our life, a relationship with him, and by his grace. That there is nothing we do 
It is all what he did. And today, we're going to look at the third purpose of Christmas in this Christmas series, and we are going to celebrate today that Christmas is not just a time to be busy. It's not just a time that is filled with stress, but truly what we can celebrate is that Jesus was born to bring reconciliation. The final purpose that we're going to explore this morning is that Christmas is a time for reconciliation. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, <clears throat> our society is not reconciled, is it? Our family gatherings are anything but peaceful. Our nation is in turmoil. Our globe is at war. Much like that song said, we might be looking at our life and say, our lives are anything but reconciled. Instead, they are stress-filled. From broken marriages to stressful families to that crazy uncle who wants to discuss the inner workings of his newest conspiracy theory, not to mention siblings, parents, politics, COVID, the list could go on and on and on of all of the stresses in our society right now. And now, if I were in your seat this morning... If I were in your seat this morning, I would probably be asking myself the question, is he serious? Is he going to just keep talking about all of these negative things? I mean, at Christmas, we're supposed to talk about the good things in our faith, good news of great joy. And I came last weekend and Pastor Kyle talked about sin, sin at Christmas, and now he's talking about stress. Sin and stress don't amount to what I was expecting to come and hear. I would be asking myself, is Kyle serious? Has he seen what's happening in our world, in our country? He can't be talking about reconciliation today. Kyle's lost it. He has no clue what's happening in my house, in my job, in my family, in my marriage, in my relationships. My life is anything but reconciled. And that's why you're here, I believe. I believe you're here because you want something different than the stress-filled chaos that our society has told us is the reason for the season. This season is about reconciliation. So the question that maybe you should be asking yourself, the question that I would be asking if I was in your seat this morning, the question I asked myself months ago when writing this is, what will cause all of this division, all of this toxicity, all of this warring and feuding and fighting to end? And here's the answer. Reconciliation with our Creator. What will it take to end all of this feuding and fighting and warring? The answer is reconciliation with our Creator. So what is reconciliation? Reconciliation is the restoration of peace in our lives. I mean, it, it seems that there will never be peace on earth, right? If we looked at all of the wars going on around us, all of the fighting, all of the warring, all of the disagreements, all of the political division, it seems like there would never, ever, ever be an end to it all. And you're probably right. There will never be peace on earth unless... There begins to be peace in our nation. And there will never be peace in our nation unless there is peace in our community. And there will never be peace in our community until there is peace in your family. And there will never be peace in your family until we are at peace with ourselves. And we will never be at peace with ourselves until the Prince of Peace reigns in our hearts. So what will it take to end all this warring and fighting and feuding? Well, reconciliation with the Prince of Peace is the answer. You see, Jesus, he is the Prince of Peace. Jesus was born at Christmas to bring us peace. 
Jesus didn't bring us all of this chaos that happened on the stage behind me just a few minutes ago. No, Jesus came to bring peace. He came to bring us peace of God, peace with God, and peace with others. Hear that again. Jesus was born into our world to bring us peace with God, the peace of God, and peace with others. Like I said at the very beginning, like our funny song said, Christmas is one of the most stressful times of the year. Jesus came into our world full of brokenness and fighting and stress, and Jesus came as the prince of peace. He came to bring us reconciliation that could be brought by nothing other than the prince of peace. He came to bring us first peace with God. You know what? You may not realize this right away. None of us do. We tend to overlook this, but when we live our lives the way we want to, When we live our lives the way we desire, instead of how God designed us, that instantly puts us in conflict with God. When we are living outside of God's designed purpose for our lives, it actually creates this conflict between us and our Creator. Last week, we said that God created us. God created you on purpose for a purpose. He created each and every one of us to live for His purpose. His purpose is a relationship with Him. When we live our way, when we live our life the way that we want to, we are living in rebellion to God's purpose. We are not at peace with God. Catch this, Isaiah 53, verse 6, I shared this last week as well, says this, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. It's this unspoken war with God that causes tension between us, between us and God, and between us and others. Being at war with God, being astray in that relationship, not being at peace with the creator of it all has lots of symptoms. It has lots of symptoms and none of them are pleasing. Listen to how the Apostle Paul describes the symptoms of living a life not at peace with God. This comes from Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 through 21 and this is the version called the message. It says it says it this way. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religions, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfying wants, a brutal temper and impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, The vicious habits of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addiction, ugly parodies of community, and I could go on. The Apostle Paul is painting a nasty picture. This is not a picture of peace. This is not a peaceful situation that Paul is describing for us. So why would I take the first eight to ten minutes of a sermon to set up just how stress-filled our lives are and just how awful a life without God in them would be? Because I think the opposite picture that Paul is about to paint is the most beautiful peace-filled life we could ever imagine. So why would I take all this time to tell you just how awful a life that is not at peace with God could be? Because I believe that a life at peace with God is the most beautiful life we could live. So we ask, what does a life 
of someone who is at peace with God look like? And Paul goes on in that chapter of Galatians, Galatians 5, 22 to 23, describes it like this, still in the message version. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives. Much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard, things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates all things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energy wisely. Maybe you've heard it this way before. These are called the fruits of the Spirit. The NIV version of that same text lists the fruits of the Spirit, a life following God's way like this. It says the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such thing there are no rules. A life at peace with God produces fruit like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And Christmas is the story of our Creator becoming human, breaking into our world to bring us that fruit. Jesus came to bridge the gap between us and God, the division that happened by us wanting to live our way. He came to reconcile us. He came to give us peace with God. But Jesus also came to give us the peace of God. Jesus, of course, came to bring us peace with God, those love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. But he also came to bring us the peace of God. Once we start to begin to live our lives in the way that God has created us, and we make peace with God, Once we've done that, we begin to experience the peace of God in our lives. What does that look like? What does that mean? As we live at peace with God, we experience the peace of God in our lives. What exactly is that peace of God? Well, it's the fruits of the Spirit that begin to grow in our lives and multiply in our life, and we begin to realize it, and the people around us begin to see it. The peace of God might look like this. The more you pray, the less you panic. The more you worship, the less you worry. The more you read God's word, the less you feel pressured and hurried. The more you give to those in need, the less you stress about finances. The more you share the love of God with others, the more you sense his love in your own life. You see, as we become at peace with God, the peace of God grows in our lives and begins to take over who we are so that the outward facing nature of who we are begins to reflect those fruits of the Spirit. We begin to live a life that honors God. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 reads like this, describing what the peace of God in your life will look like. Philippians says this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And here's the promise, he says. When we do that, when we are at peace with God and we begin to live a life with the peace of God in it, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You see, the peace of God in our life produces peace that surpasses our human understanding. It brings peace that when we are met with a stress-filled situation, we don't respond like everybody would think. Instead, we respond out of love, out of joy, out of peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, they say that some of the most stressful moments in a person's life, what tops the list as the highest stress moments of somebody's life are getting a new job, moving, and having a child. 
Those are number one, two, and three. They change order from time to time, but number one, two, and three of the most stressful times in our lives are getting a new job, moving, and having a child. When I was 25 years old, I decided that I would do them all three in one week. <laughs> When I was 29, I decided to do them all in one month. <laughs> Twice, my family and I have sensed God's call in our lives to follow him in ministry and take a new job at a church. When I was 25, uh, Anna and I had just had our first son, Drew, who's 17 now, uh, and about a week after he was born, we decided to tell our families that a church 300 miles away on the Canadian border in International Falls, Minnesota, we grew up as suburban kids just outside of the Twin Cities, had called us to be their, their youth pastor. And when we told our family and our friends that we were doing this, we were met with comments of, are you crazy? Are you nuts? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, Kyle. You both have good jobs here, a house, and your families are one mile and five miles from you and just had their first grandchild. Why would you do that to them? Yet the peace of God convinced us that God was calling us to this other thing. And because of the peace of God in our lives, we stepped forward and we were met with love, with joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. That five years spent in International Falls at that point was the best five years of our lives. Again, five years later, we were met with a similar call, ready to move, buy a new house, take on a new job, and have our fourth son all at the same time once again. And each time we've gone through these crazy stress-filled times because we were at peace with God. Because we had been reconciled to God, we allowed the peace of God to take over our lives. And when we did, we experienced the fruits of the Spirit. And you can too. I don't know what the stress is that is going on in your life, but I do know this. Whatever it is, if you are at peace with God and experiencing the peace of God, you will know beyond a shadow of any human doubt that you are doing what you are supposed to do. His peace relieved our anxiety, our stress. It gave us strength to have those conversations with people that thought we were crazy. Because when we are at peace with God and living in the peace of God, He gives us a peace that surpasses our understanding. So Jesus came to bring us peace with God and the peace of God. The final type of peace that Jesus brought to us through his birth is peace with others. Jesus came to bring us peace with others. Once we're at peace with God and we experience the fruit of the peace of God in our lives, we begin to live a life that is at peace with others. God will help us learn how to be at peace with all people. <laughs> I know what you might be thinking. You might be thinking, yeah, right. <laughs> peace with all people? Kyle, don't you remember talking about all of those wars in our world, all of those stressors of our family? Kyle, you're crazy if you think I'm going to be at peace with all people. I mean... Kyle, you don't know my brother. <laughs> Kyle, you don't know my sister, my neighbor, my boss, my kids, my family, my... Well, you fill in the blank with the people that I don't know that you aren't at peace with. And you're right. I don't know them. I don't know what has caused stress in that relationship. I don't know what has broken down the peace in those situations. I don't know all the people in your life. I don't know what they have done to you, and I don't know what you have done to them. I don't know the depths of that brokenness and pain in any of those relationships. But what I do know is this. What I do know is that when we are at peace with God, and we are experiencing the fruit of peace of God, he begins the process of turning you and I into peacemakers. 
He begins the process of turning you and I into peacemakers. When we, are at pe- when we have the peace of God and we see that peace with God in our lives, it begins to create this desire for humility. And humility breeds peace with all people around us. It breeds reconciliation in broken places and broken relationships. Matthew chapter 5 verse 9 reads like this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons and daughters of God. Now notice something here. Jesus did not say, blessed are the people who love peace. I mean, we all love peace, right? We all love tranquility and calm. Jesus also did not say, blessed are the peaceable. Those people who avoid being troubled by anything. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. So what's a peacemaker? Well, it might be easier to start with what a peacemaker is not. A peacemaker is not avoiding conflict. A peacemaker is not running from a problem. It is not passivity and it is not allowing others to do whatever, whenever they want. Now those do not promote peace. A peacemaker is actually somebody who works for peace. They actively seek peace. They seek to bring an end to conflict in their lives, no matter the situation. A peacemaker is somebody who takes the responsibility of promoting reconciliation whenever and why ever a relationship breaks down. It's somebody who offers forgiveness to those who hurt them. It's much like God, right? It's much like God. Offering forgiveness to those who hurt them is what God did for us, right? It's why he sent Jesus on Christmas into this society. Romans 5, 8 reads like this, but God demonstrated his own love for you and me And all of humanity, God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, that's reconciliation. That's a peacemaker. While we were still sinning, Jesus died for you. Because he was a peacemaker. It didn't matter to him what you did. He loved you anyway, and he wanted to reconcile that relationship But as humans, we don't behave like this. Many of us refuse to forgive because we confuse forgiveness with trust. I want to be clear here today. Forgiveness is not the same as trust. Forgiveness is free. It's what God did for us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But trust is different. Forgiveness takes care of what has happened in the past. It's offered even when it isn't deserved. Just like God did, offering forgiveness is what allows us to move forward. It's what allows us to move on, no longer being held in our past or holding what we believe is holding a grudge, but is actually holding us. Trust, however is different. Trust is all about the future. Trust can be lost in an instant and take a lifetime to get back. For example, what does a peacemaker do when they're abused? In any abuse relationship, any sort of abuse, here's a tough truth. God expects God expects us to forgive the person who abused us. But he doesn't expect us to trust them again. He expects us to forgive so that bitterness and resentment don't poison our future. But God God wants us to trust, but forgiveness is what he expects. Forgiveness sets us free to move on and move forward. And you might be thinking, Kyle, I could never do that. I could never forgive that person. If you knew what they had done to me, you wouldn't tell me to forgive them. The memories are too painful, too hurtful, too deep. I just can't forgive them. And you know what? If you're thinking that, you're right. 
You can't. But he can. He can through you. You're right. You can't do this on your own. That's why we needed Jesus to come into our world, to break into this stress-filled society and show us what being a peacemaker is all about. That is precisely why we needed Jesus to be our Savior because it is only when we feel fully forgiven for our past that we're allowed, that we're able to forgive others who've hurt us. So as we wrap up today, let us remember that Jesus came to help us reconcile peace in our lives, to be at peace with God, to bring us the peace of God, and to help us be at peace with others. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for today, and I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you that he came into this world to bring us peace. God, I thank you that he came into our society to help us know a new way forward. God, that we can be at peace with you and that we can have your peace take over our lives so that, God, when we are at peace with you, we can begin to see the fruit of that peace develop in our lives. We can see things like love and joy and peace and patience develop within us so that others can see it fully in our lives. Father God, we invite you into our lives right now to help us become peacemakers. To be at peace with you, to experience the peace of you, and to experience peace in all of our relationships. In Jesus' name, amen.